Amen. All right. Uh, the title of the sermon this evening is, What is an Evangelist? What is an Evangelist? Now, today, of course, in 2019, there is a lot of confusion uh, when it comes to uh, church structure. There's a lot of confusion when it comes to the offices of the church and, and the jobs and the duties of a pastor, the jobs and the duties of a deacon, uh, what the structure should look like, who really has authority, just in every angle. There are those that are of the camp or of the stripe that everything about the New Testament local church that we see today, the contemporaries at least, they need to be totally rebuilt. That everything's wrong, you know, the, the New Testament local church, it's, it's completely in error. And I do not believe that at all. That's not where I fall in at all. I believe that the, by and large, the local New Testament churches that we see today, outside of a few errors, I believe that they are correct and the offices that they hold. But there are a few little small things that I think that they are in error about. And one of those things is an evangelist. Now, <clears throat> the sermon this evening, uh, it, it's possible that it could be rather short. And that's because the word evangelist only comes up three times in the Bible. We're going to look at every single time and we're going to try to compare Scripture with Scripture and get an idea of what the Bible means when it says evangelist. We're going to look diligently and try not to leave any stone unturned, any Scriptures maybe that we can compare we are going to do so. But I, I, I uh, submit to you before we dive into this, number one, I want you to uh, you know, put aside any preconceived ideas. I want you, number two, to understand that everything that we believe needs to be drawn from Scripture. Anything that we believe, we need to believe it because the Bible teaches that particular doctrine. Because that's what the Bible teaches about an evangelist. And uh, there are, I believe, many errors in the understanding of what an evangelist is Today, So with that in mind, here we're going to look at the first mention of the three in 2 Timothy chapter number 4. This is Paul writing to Timothy, and it's considered one of the pastoral epistles. Look here in verse number 5. He tells him this <coughs> in verse number 5. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Now, really the only thing that we can take away from this specific verse is, number one, Timothy has a ministry. We're not told the specifics. You can't really be you know, uh, definitive or conclusive about the ministry that Timothy had, whether he was a pastor, whether he wasn't a pastor, whether maybe he did the same thing as Paul. But we don't know exactly what his job was, but we do know that one of the charges that Paul gave him was, do the work of an evangelist. You know what that tells me is that there is a work of an evangelist. We can learn that, right? That whatever ministry Timothy had, there is a work of an evangelist that would apply to the work that he did. There is a certain type of work that an evangelist does. Now, I want you to go to Acts chapter number 21, verse number 8. We're going to look at the second mention. <coughs> Acts chapter number 21, verse number 8, because we want to learn what is the work of an evangelist. Acts chapter number 21, chapter number 21, and we're going to look at verse number 8. Acts chapter number 21, and that's verse number 8. It says this, <coughs> excuse me, and the, de and the next day we, <coughs> excuse me, and the next day we that were, were, were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And then it says this, And we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven. Now that's important. I want you to keep that in mind as well. So notice they entered into the house of Philip, and he's called the Evangelist. And he's also, to help us identify who they're talking about, he is one of the, of the seven. And then it tells us that they abode with him. It says, and, and abode with him. So they stayed there with him. So now we see the word Evangelist... <coughs> being used again and here the word evangelist is being used more so as a title isn't it like this is actually what he does right so before we saw that there was a work of an evangelist there's a there's a type of work that an evangelist does now we have an example of someone that is a, is an evangelist the instructions that are given to Timothy makes me think that he wasn't an evangelist, but that he's going to be doing. He wasn't specifically an evangelist, uh, but he's supposed to be doing the work that an evangelist does. If you say a full-time evangelist, let's say that. But he, So he's going to be doing that work. So it is possible, I guess, that maybe he was a pastor, maybe he had some other ministry, and that Paul is charging him, hey, you know what an evangelist does. 
You can do, you need to do the work of an evangelist. You need to do what an evangelist does. Or you could even say, hey, it's possible, of course, also as the interpretation to say that maybe he was an evangelist and that's why Paul is saying, hey, you're an evangelist, do the work of an evangelist. Both those interpretations are possible. But the point is this. Here in Acts chapter number 21, verse number 8, we have an example of an evangelist. We know for a fact that Philip is an evangelist. So this is a good start for us. We can learn a lot from this passage. We are told Philip the evangelist. So now that we know that there's a work that an evangelist does, we have an example of a person that is an evangelist, let's look in Scripture and see the work that this person does previous to this. I want you to look here, and, and after this he's not mentioned very much, but I want you to look in Acts chapter number 8, verse number 12. These are the times that Philip is really uh, talked about a lot, is, is really in the chapter of Acts 8. Acts chapter number 8. <clears throat> He kind of falls off the map there in the, 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 uh, uh, middle, ch the middle chapters, the, the conjoining chapters between chapter 8 and chapter 21, but he's spoken of a lot here in Acts chapter number 8. So look at verse number 12. Acts chapter number 8, <coughs> verse number 12 says this. <coughs> Actually, let's go back to verse 5. It says this, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with, with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city, and there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and, be, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had be bewitched them with sorceries. Verse 12, But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and and women. And then he goes on to keep speaking about what happens with the man Simon. So, so far, what do we have Philip doing? Just so far of what we've read, what does he constantly mention they're doing? Preaching the gospel, isn't he? He's constantly mentioned of just preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I do want you to recognize as well, are, is this a group of people that have heard the gospel previously? No. This is a, this is a new area that, that Philip has went into and he's preaching to them Jesus because they hadn't heard the gospel yet. So that's key. That's very important. In this same chapter, I want you to skip down to uh, verse number 25. Verse number 25, it says this, And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So where are they going? They're going to places that have not yet received the gospel. I want you to notice that they're going to areas that have not yet received the gospel. When it says they there, it's talking in context about the same group of people. Peter came down, so it's Philip and Peter and all of them. I want you to look at verse number 26. It says this, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise! And go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him. And heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer. So opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? Verse 34. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Thir verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And it goes on and explains, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And of course, they go down, both of them into the water, and he baptizes him, right? <clears throat> After he believes. He tells him you have to believe first. That was like an NIV version I gave you there for a moment. 
But notice what happens. Each time we see Philip doing something, what is he doing? He's preaching the gospel, right? But not only that, he's going to areas and he's going to people that have not yet heard the gospel. That's specifically what he's doing. And we see here that the Holy Spirit is the one that is calling Philip to this work. Now, who's the author of Scripture? The Holy Spirit. And who called Philip the evangelist? It would be the Holy Spirit. So when we look in Scripture and we see in the book of Acts, we see that the Holy Spirit's the one that, that has Philip going and doing these things. We see that when Philip is mentioned, he's always doing the same thing. And what is it? Every single time. Preaching the gospel, right? He's going out and he's preaching the gospel. He's doing a work. We see that there's a work that, that is entailed with that from 2 Timothy 4, 5. The work of an evangelist. Isn't preaching the gospel work? It, it is. Jesus talked about sending forth labors into the harvest when he's talking about going out and preaching the gospel, right? So we can see that there is a work of an evangelist. We see Philip doing work and it's preaching the gospel. And then we look and see that Philip is called the evangelist by the Holy Spirit. Makes perfect sense. This is the only time where Philip is really mentioned a lot. It's the only things that you see Philip doing. Now, just from Scripture, I believe that it's obvious that an evangelist is someone that preaches the gospel. I'm going to get more into depth with that. And you do not need Greek at all. You don't need Greek to understand anything in the King James Bible. I believe that this is as clear as day. Our word evangelist comes from the Greek word evangelio, which is the Greek word for gospel. So it, even if you wanted to look at it and see if you could learn anything from it, it's the same word that means gospel, evangelio. Even if you don't know Greek, you can look at it and see that it's spelled and it looks like the word evangelist. The word evangelist in English, the definition of the word is someone that preaches the gospel. That's what an evangelist is. Now there are people today that have uh, the title of being an evangelist. And a lot of them are aware of what the word evangelist means, that it means someone that preaches the gospel. But the problem is, when we see people preaching the gospel in the Bible, what are they always doing? They're always going to people, and it's what we would refer to as soul winning. They're always going out and they're always evangelizing people that have not yet received the gospel. That is the job of an evangelist. When you see the only time someone's called the evangelist, what is he always doing? Every time he's talked about, if you see a record of his life, He's going to areas where people have not yet received the gospel. That is the job of an evangelist. So the modern day evangelist, most churches, is a person that, and hey, let me say this first, I love a lot, there's a lot of evangelists that I have a lot of love for that I know very well, that I believe are saved, men that are strong spiritually, but they're confused about their own job. They're confused about what they're doing. There are a lot of people that are referred to as evangelists and what they do is they have a route of churches and they have this circuit and they just travel from church to church and you know who they preach to? Saved people. People that are already saved. And these are people that are aware that the word evangelist means someone that preaches the gospel. Well, of course, when these people stand up every time from church to church to church, are they just preaching the gospel every single time? Not every single time. You know, uh, it, it is sad that oftentimes they do, you know, uh, preach the gospel repeatedly and they're not feeding people, which they shouldn't be doing that. But oftentimes they'll stand up and they'll just preach you a message, right? They'll just preach you anything from the Bible. That's the pastor's job. That's the job of the shepherd. He is meant to feed the flock. That's what the overseer, the bishop, is supposed to be doing. So there's a misunderstanding today in Baptist churches about an evangelist. When we look at the only example of an evangelist in the Bible, Philip the evangelist, he is preaching the gospel to the lost. Now, if these people are traveling from city to city and they're going out into the highways and the hedges and they are preaching Jesus Christ to those that are lost, Amen. They are an evangelist. If they're going to areas where people have never heard the gospel, I would agree with you that biblically and scripturally, they fit the job title of being an evangelist. That is what an evangelist is. There's a great misunderstanding of an evangelist. but we only, the, 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 the funny thing is that it's a very simple subject because it's not brought up very much in the Bible. So, one more time, there's work of an evangelist. We identify a person that is called an evangelist and he's doing work and what is it? He's preaching the gospel. And the word evangelist, the definition of it is someone that preaches the gospel. Now I want to get to the second point uh, or the second misunderstandings that a lot of misunderstanding that a lot of people here are familiar with of an evangelist. An evangelist is not a church office position. An evangelist is not a church office position and I'm going to show you that. So here we have an example of an evangelist. We have an example of a person that's called 
Philip the evangelist. And I don't think it's a coincidence that this person, it tells you, excuse me, is of the seven. Now what is that referring to? Go to Acts chapter number 6. Go to Acts chapter number 6. Just a couple of chapters back. So we read in Acts 21 verse number 8, Philip the evangelist who is of the seven. <clears throat> We're going to see what group of the seven he's referred to here in Acts chapter number 6. Look at verse number 1. It says this, And in those days, <coughs> when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So this is the, these are the apostles, the twelve apostles. So they're saying that it's not right for us to leave reading the word of God and ministering the word of God, preaching the word of God and go and do you know, all of this physical labor. It wouldn't make sense for us to do that. We were called to preach the word of God, right? Look at verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report. So there we see the seven. Full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Verse 5, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. That's one. And Philip and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. That's seven total. And notice who is mentioned in there. The man named Philip. Now, this right here is a list of the first deacons. The job of a deacon is to do the physical labor around the church. That is the job of a deacon. The word deacon means servant. The word deacon means steward. Those are the definitions if you look up the word deacon. It means steward or it means servant. What are these men doing here? They're supposed to be serving tables. They're supposed to be serving tables and serving those um, that are being neglected, it says. These are people that are going to be neg that are, that are neglect being neglected and they are widows and there's work, physical work that needs to be done. The bishop is talked about. We're gonna, I want you to go ahead and go over to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. The bishop is talked about as being the overseer many times and he is also referred to as the shepherd. He's referred to as the shepherd. The word pastor, and let me clear up a little bit of confusion about the word pastor. The word pastor means shepherd. If you look up the word pastor all throughout the Old Testament, especially in the book of Jeremiah, many times in the book of Jeremiah, it talks about the pastors feeding the flock. Well, who feeds the flock? A shepherd. You look in the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter number 2, I believe maybe it's verse number 4 or verse 24. 1 Peter chapter number 2, it tells you that, uh, that they were gone astray, but you are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul. So notice what's used coupled together there is shepherd and bishop. Shepherd means pastor, okay? So today, oftentimes, we refer to the bishop as pastor because that is also a synonymous term according to 1 uh, Peter chapter number 2. He is a, a Jesus who is the bishop of our souls is called the shepherd and bishop of our, of our soul. So a pastor's job is to do what? Feed the flock. A bishop's job over and over again throughout the Bible, like we read earlier today in, um, in Acts chapter number, what is it, 20, I believe. Acts chapter number 20, when Paul calls the bishops and the elders together, what does he tell them? Feed the flock of God which is among you. So what does that tell you they are? They're shepherds or they are pastors, the same thing. So you can call a bishop a pastor. That is perfectly fine. Now, in the Old Testament... Jeremiah is referred to as a pastor. He had a very specific job of being a pastor. This was a job that was given to him as an Old Testament prophet. Old Testament prophets are like the New Testament counterpart of the apostles. So these positions are not available any longer. All the apostles are gone. You know, uh, there were apostles and then of course they set up the local New Testament churches and they're out of the picture now. There are, there are no longer any apostles. They don't exist anymore longer, right? So that is the structure that we are left with and uh, it would be the pastor as the overseer and then we're going to get into the other part right now. I want you to look as I said at 1 Timothy chapter number 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 3 we are given the qualifications of two offices. We are given the qualifications of 
two offices here in 1 Timothy chapter number 3. It says this, This is a true saying, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And as I quoted you, 1 Peter chapter 2 is what's being used interchangeable with shepherd. That's why we call a bishop pastor day, because they're used interchangeable. He goes through here, and he gives you, the, uh, he gives you um, clear qualifications for a bishop. The bishop is also, and this is outside the scope of the sermon, the bishop is also referred to as the ruler, and he's also referred to as the overseer. And that is the definition of the word bishop. It is an overseer or it is a ruler. We are also given, if we look down at verse number 10, there is also another office of the New Testament church that is mentioned here in verse number 10. And it says this, and let these also first be proved. Well, I'm sorry, it actually begins in verse number 8. Likewise must, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. He goes on and on. If we go down to verse number 13, it says this, For they that have used, watch what it says, the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. When you look in the New Testament and you look for different positions that are mentioned that are talked about in the local New Testament church. Actual offices where people are ordained in the, the local New Testament church. You only find two. You only find qualifications given for two positions. Now when we look in Acts chapter number 6, do you remember that there were qualifications given there? Do you remember what one of them was? He had to be of good report. What do we see here with a deacon? He has to be of good report, doesn't he? There's other qualifications that are given, given as well. They take that man and they ordain him. And notice that his work is meant to be in Acts 6 in the local New Testament church, wasn't it? It was meant to be in that specific church. And what were they supposed to be doing? Serving tables, which lines up perfectly with the definition of a deacon. That is the definition or what the word deacon means. It means to be, <coughs> excuse me, a servant. So if we look at Acts 6 and we compare that unto 1 Timothy chapter number 3, we see the same qualifications given. We see that this is the only other position outside of being a bishop or being a ruler in what is the job meant to be. It's meant to be a, they are meant to be a servant, right? So that's one of the things that I want to put into your mind right now. I want you to understand and, and think about this very, very earnestly. There are, I'm going to say this again. There are only two positions. There are only two offices that are spoken of of the New Testament local church where someone is ordained to do work in the New Testament local church where also there are qualifications given ever in the whole New Testament. A bishop and a deacon. Now if there was another position or another office. If one of the other titles that are given, if it was an office where someone would be ordained to do work in the local New Testament church, wouldn't you think that there would be qualifications for that position? So isn't that kind of odd that there aren't qualifications for any other position outside of the deacon and the bishop? Isn't that kind of odd if there are other positions? Because we know how God deals with things, that there needs to be qualifications. Not only that, what is an evangelist? It is someone that preaches the gospel, right? And there is the work of an evangelist. When we look at the person that is given as uh, uh, the evangelist, he's called an evangelist, he is actually one of the seven. And what do those seven line up perfectly with in our Bible? We see that they are ordained. They have hands laid upon them. Their job is to be a servant or a steward. And we see that there are qualifications. What are the only two positions in the local New Testament church where there are qualifications? A bishop and a deacon. So, obviously we know that they weren't bishops. Their job was not to minister to the Word of God necessarily. They did go out and preach the gospel, but their job was not to feed the flock of God among them, was it? Because they weren't the overseer of that congregation. What was their job? To be a servant. Not only that, we see one of the qualifications that's mentioned in Acts 6, and it's that they have to be of a good report. One of the qualifications of a deacon is to be of a good report. So we see Philip the Evangelist. He's called the Evangelist. But what actual office does he hold when it comes to the church? 
He holds the position of a deacon. It looks like it lines up perfectly with 1 Timothy chapter number 3. Now, isn't it interesting that in order to hold a position like this, you're ordained. We see them do what when they ordain the seven, the deacons? They have hands laid upon them. There is never a mention where Philip himself is ever ordained into any other position other than a deacon. But we see him referred to as the evangelist. Not only that, there is never a time ever in the Bible in which it talks about the responsibilities in the local New Testament church of an evangelist. It never speaks of responsibilities of an evangelist in a local New Testament church. Ever. Not one time. You know what that tells me? There are no responsibilities of an evangelist in a local New Testament church. Where the Bible's silent, you should be silent. So if you believe that evangelists need to have some sort of responsibilities or jobs, then you better point me to a scripture. But the Bible does not teach that. The Bible actually tells us there's work of an evangelist, that there's a person that's an evangelist, but that person was ordained to another office. So you know what that means is, being an evangelist is just what we read about. It's someone that is a soul winner. It really is that simple. It's a person that's going out and evangelizing areas, specifically where maybe someone has never heard the gospel. They're going out and they are preaching the gospel. That's all that there is. On top of that, we look and we scour the New Testament scriptures for any qualifications or any office that's ever mentioned. And you know what we find? Two offices. Bishop and deacon. You know what that tells me? Just believe the Bible for what it says. And, and if it doesn't say something, we shouldn't be injecting that into Scripture. Amen. That tells me there's two offices in the New Testament. You know what they are? Bishop and deacon. It's really that simple. We shouldn't be adding to Scripture. What we start doing is we start creating a mess. When we start adding all of these offices, we start adding all of these positions to Scripture. There are two offices in the New Testament according to the Bible. Bishop and deacon. It's that simple. I want you to go now with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 11. Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 11. We're going to look at the third mention of <coughs> evangelists. This is, of course, the passage we read recently, and it's talking about the gifts that are given. It's talking about all the, <coughs> excuse me, the different gifts that are given. It says this in verse number 11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now what's mentioned here in verse number 11 are not all, they're not all positions or offices in the church, are they? So what we see here are, number one, we see apostles that are mentioned. Now we know, of course, today there are no more apostles, right? An apostle was, a, was an office because it talks about, uh, well, at least you could say a disciple of Christ was, which those would be the twelve. Was Judas ever referred to as an apostle? I think he was because they were called apostles in, in the, I think, in the book of Luke. You could look that up on your own, but it talks about um, the, the, the um, prophecy of Judas, it says, let his habitation be desolate and let his bishopric another man take. So a bishopric is obviously referring to the office. It's referring to the office of being a position within a church, right? So you can see that an apostle would be referred to as some sort of office, right? An actual office that God ordains someone into and they hold like in a local New Testament church. Some churches would have an apostle there that would be more at the rank, right? They would be over top of what would be considered the bishop. If you notice, you look at this, this, this list, there is, no, um, there is no bishop mentioned. I believe that the pastor here is referring to the bishop, but I believe that it's referring to him as the pastor because it's not talking about his role necessarily in the church. It's talking about the gifts. It's talking about him pastoring. It's talking about him shepherding. It's talking about him feeding the flock because it's not necessarily talking about offices right now. That's why we don't see deacon specifically mentioned either because we're not talking about specific offices. Doesn't that make perfect sense? Because we look back and it says, it says right before that, um, and he gave some, verse 11, right? Look up at verse 8 at the very end, and gave gifts unto men. So the psalm is referring to the gifts that he gave to the different churches, right? The gift of pastoring, right? Uh, it's talking about the gift of being an apostle, whatever all that entails. It's probably the signs and the miracles that they were able to work that could be specifically that. So these are gifts that these, that these uh, uh, people would possess. The, gifts, uh, the gift of being a teacher. Is that an office in the New Testament church? Of course not. So these are gifts that a person would have. And you know what else is mentioned there? An evangelist. Some evangelists. So notice that there are multiple evangelists. You know what it means? 
It means people are preaching the gospel. It's that simple. This is not really a difficult subject, and a lot of people make it difficult. If we look up the word evangelist, it's only used, like I said, three times in the New Testament. Number one, we're seeing, we see that there is the work of an evangelist. Number two, we see a person who is called the evangelist, and he's doing work, and he's preaching the gospel. Not only that, that man holds the office of a deacon in a local New Testament church, and he's never mentioned as being ordained into that position. And what do we see him doing? He's going out and he's preaching the gospel. He's evangelizing. He's going out and he's preaching the gospel to areas that have not yet received the gospel. Here we see the third mention of the word evangelist. This is a very shallow, simple subject. Shallow may not be the right word, but it's a very simple subject in the Bible. It's very rudimentary. But people have made it very confusing. I want you to go now with me to Philippians chapter number 1. We're actually going to end in Philippians chapter number 1. <clears throat> Philippians chapter number 1. This is the only time where we see uh, a specific list of, and this is powerful, these couple of times because it only is mentioned a couple of times. This is the only time we see a list of offices mentioned in the Bible. And it's the exact same offices that are mentioned in 1 Timothy 3 and none else. And none else. Do you get that? The only two offices that are actually given qualifications. Look at Philippians chapter number 1, verse number 1. It says this, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi. Now, who are those? Those are the members of the church. Look at what it says next. With the bishops and deacons. And then he goes on. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Further proof that, just like 1 Timothy 3 said, there are only two offices of the local New Testament church. Now, you, you know, you may be asking, like, hey, prove to me that evangelist is not a position in the local New Testament church. The only reason why a person would ask that question in the first place is because they believe something that's not in Scripture. I can just tell you this. It's never mentioned. I think that it's powerful enough, the fact that we look in the New Testament, and there is never a time a person is ordained as an evangelist in the local New Testament church. The only time anyone is ordained in, in the local New Testament church is into the positions of a bishop and a deacon. And then in, uh, in congruence with that, we see that the person that's called an evangelist is actually a what? He's a deacon. That's powerful in and of itself, showing that that's not, he's not holding a dual office here. You know what it, you know what it means? is that he's just a preacher of the gospel. That's all that it means. That's actually what the word evangelist means. Then we see that there are qualifications given in the New Testament for two offices, and what are they? Bishop and deacon. We see in the book of uh, Philippians, where he's writing to the church at Philipp Philippi, that leaders are mentioned in the church, and who are they? Bishops and deacons. No evangelists. When he's actually writing to the church, he then decides that he's going to, to name the offices within the church. Evangelist is not mentioned. It's bishop and deacon. Now, if Philip would have been a part of that church, would he have been addressed? Yeah, because he was a deacon. Under the title or the office of a deacon. So, in summary, it really is this basic and this simple. What is an evangelist? What do we see as an evangelist? If we look throughout Scripture... It is just a person that preaches the gospel. It is a very simple subject that people have conflated. That's really what it is. It's a very simple um, you know, uh, a job or title that people have conflated. It's not a job or title within the local New Testament church as far as a position of leadership or authority within the local New Testament church. So really what we have... In this church, if everybody goes soul winning, we have a bunch of evangelists. We have Russell the evangelist. We have Anthony the evangelist. We have, you know, the la I don't want to leave out the ladies. Esther and Ashley the evangelist. Everyone here, if you go out and you preach the gospel, do you know what you are? You're just like Philip the evangelist. Amen. Do you know why he's called the evangelist by the Holy Spirit? Because he's going out and he's preaching the gospel. The word evangelist means a preacher of the gospel. That's exactly what it means. So we need to have an understanding of these basic doctrines in the Bible of what even an evangelist is. It is not like a bishop. It is not like a deacon. And this may bother people. This may, you know, uh, you know there are obviously you know, uh, related 
circumstances to this particular doctrine that caused me to think about it and look more into it. But let me say this very clearly. An evangelist has zero authority as far as in the local New Testament church, ever. There is never a time when an evangelist is ever making a decision, is ever talked about as being any sort of leader, ever. It's used three times, and it's talking about preaching the gospel. Do you know what an evangelist is? It's someone that's sent out to preach the gospel. Amen. That can be someone sent from a local New Testament church that's preaching the gospel. That can be a person that's sent from this country to another country. Hey, an, a missionary would be an evangelist, man. I agree with that. Amen. That is an evangelist if they go to another country to evangelize people with the gospel. I agree with that. But you know what? They have no authority in a local New Testament church. Amen. The bishops and the deacons are the ones that have to meet qualifications because they are taking on responsibilities of leaders. That's it. That's all that it is. It's a very simple subject. An evangelist is a preacher of the gospel. So be an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for making the Bible simple. We thank you when men are confused, when people will try to confuse us also. You can just look at the Bible and see very simply uh, that it's, that it's a, a much easier subject to understand, dear God. And we thank you, dear Lord, that we can have the washing of the water by the word and, and you can kind of rinse out all that other stuff that may be confusing in your mind of what an evangelist is or, or what any position is or maybe uh, you know who's the ruler of the church or uh, what the deacons actually are supposed to do, dear God. And of any area, you know, we're, we're thankful that the Bible includes everything that we need to serve you here in the body of Christ. Uh, we thank you for giving us the ministry of reconciliation and giving us the, the ability to be able to have the title as an evangelist. We ask you to be with us and bless the rest of the night. Bless the food and in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.